Where are you then, Bassett? How many of you in college? Raise your hand. High school. If you are a student, those students around you, they're looking at you and they will judge Islam by what they see from you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wa ahduhu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdu wa rasul amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, I am thankful to Allah the Almighty to have the privilege to come back to Norway to speak to you for just a few moments. You've had a long day. And after Sheikh Ala gave that tremendous talk, I'm going to just be with you a few moments. I want you to take a look in this magnificent earth that Allah created, uh, created for us. Seven billion people. Two billion, two hundred million Christians. One billion, eight hundred million Muslims. One billion Hindu. Five hundred million Buddhists and they say some 15 million Jews. We are among them, among these religious people as Muslims. I met a Muslim from South Africa named Ibrahim Rasul. He's a South African ambassador to the United States. Magnificent brother. Not only was he the ambassador, he was once the governor of one of the regions in South Africa, a devoted Muslim. Population of South Africa, 57 million people, less than 2% Muslims. And yet this man, Ibrahim Rasul, was the ambassador of South Africa. I believe that every once in a while something happens in the world that is so huge that it's a lesson for us. South Africa. You've heard of Nelson Mandela. When Nelson Mandela died, 91 heads of state, presidents, prime ministers, kings, princes, came to his memorial. From the United States itself, four presidents, President Obama, President Clinton, President Bush, and Jimmy Carter, 26 congressmen came to his memorial. Why? Because this man, Nelson Mandela, had the audacity to be in prison 27 years but he fought for justice in his country, and he became an icon. What you didn't know, that when he became president, the first African president of South Africa, he had nine members, Muslims, on his cabinet, 17 members of parliament in that government, because the Muslims were a part of the country. My message today, either we are good ambassadors or bad ambassadors. I was in London, met a brother named Khalid, born in Kuwait, grew up in Saudi Arabia. I met him, he said, Imam Siraj, I was in Germany for 25 years. And the people used to love the Muslims. Now they hate the Muslims. Why is that? My question tonight for you, are you going to be a good ambassador for Islam or a bad 
ambassador. The greatest ambassadors for mankind were the prophets. Whenever a messenger of Allah came, they didn't come because something is right, they came because something is wrong. And the job of the prophets was to take the people from darkness and bring them into the light. Allah is the wali of those who believe. He takes them from the darkness and he brings them into the light. Are we good ambassadors or bad ambassadors? Sisters, would you mind, can I talk to the brothers for one minute? Yes? Brothers, I want to ask you a question. Don't worry, the sisters, they can't hear us. And you got to be honest. How many of you like and are attracted to women? Raise your hand. Okay, you brother didn't raise your hand. See me afterwards. I want to talk to you. If you're going to be a good ambassador for Allah, you're going to be a slave of Allah. Notice, we are not called soldiers. We are slaves. What's the difference? When you become a soldier, you go to 10 months basic training. What they do, they cut your hair Everyone have the same hairdo. They put you on a uniform. You eat the same food. You live in the same quarters. Why? Because their job is to make you soldiers. You are not a soldier. You are a slave of Allah. Let me give you one example. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, sent the Muslim on a ghazwa expedition. And he took a man from the Ansar and he said, obey him. And when they went out, this leader that the prophet appointed, alayhi salat wa salam, he asked them, did the prophet tell you to obey me? They said, yes. He said, I order you to build a fire. And they did. And then he said, I order you to go into the fire. And they stopped. And they looked at one another. They hesitated. They paused. One of them said that we came to follow the prophet to save us from the fire. How then should we go in? And then they were talking. And all of a sudden, the anger of this man dissipated. And when the news got back to the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and they told him what happened, this is what he said. There's three versions. I'll give you all three. Number one, laudakaluha. Had they gone in that fire, they would not have come out because obedience is only toward that which is right. Number two. Had they gone in that fire, they'd never have come out until the day of judgment. The third one, the scariest. Had they gone in that fire, they would have never come out because obedience is only toward that which is right. Obey Allah. Obey the messenger and those charged with authority among you. If you differ with anything, refer back to Allah and the messenger, if it is you believe in Allah in the last days. I love to read. And I want to quote from uh, who is considered the greatest historian of our time. He's a British historian. And he wrote a 12-volume book, The History of the World, thousands of pages. And he said three things that I'm going to repeat here. He said, civilizations are not murdered 
they die of suicide. Someone once said, suicide is a permanent solution for a temporary problem. They commit suicide. We find, and I want to be honest with you, and the scholars do not disagree. Scholars agree that smoking cigarettes is haram. It's destructive. It kills lives. In the United States, over 500,000 people die a year as a result of smoking cigarettes. The World Health Organization of the United Nations said that if the nations of the world do nothing about it, by the end of the 21st century, one billion people would have died as a result of smoking cigarettes. Number two, scary. He said of the 22 civilizations that appeared, 19 of them collapsed when they reached the moral state that the United States is in now. He died in 1975, which means the moral state is worse. And this is the last one, a quote. I want you to pay attention. This is not a Muslim. He's a historian, a scholar. Listen to what he said. The solution to all international conflicts lies only in embracing Islam in mass because Islam is the only religion that can transcend nationalism. I see with great dismay that nationalism is gaining grounds even among the bearers of the Quran. I will pray and hope for one day when all humanity will break this idol and unite as the children of God. I want you to look at me, take a look at me. Did you notice Anna Aswad? Anna Aswad, what does that mean? I'm black. And you know what? I love being black. I can't wait to wake up every day black. <laughs> you should ask the question, why? Because Allah said, It is Allah who created you in the womb as he pleased. If Allah is pleased to make me a black man, I'm happy to be a black man. And everyone, Everyone ought to be happy however Allah made you. Anna Aswad, yes, I'm black. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, In Allah Ta'ala, لا يَنْذُرُوا إِلَىٰ أَسَامِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ سُوَادِكُمْ وَلَكَنْ يَنْذُرُوا إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَعَمَالِكُمْ Allah the Almighty will not look to your bodies nor your forms, but he looked to your heart and your deeds. Number one, Anna Aswad. Number two, Anna Amuriki Yun. I'm American. I'm born in America. That's my country. I love my country. And I fight against administrations. That's not good. But I am American. Number three, Anna Amuriki Yun. I'm African. My foreparents came from Africa. I don't even know what country, but I know that we are Africans and I'm happy to be African. Number four, I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim by choice. I became Muslim. I studied Islam. I love Islam. And on the day of judgment, there will not be one black person in Jannah because they're black. There will not be one white person in hell because they're white. There'll be not one woman in hell because she's a woman but it is based upon our deeds. That's how Allah judges us. And now we are supposed to be the ambassadors for Allah in the religion of Islam. In Norway, there may be some people who will never read one verse of the Quran or even one hadith, but the people in Norway, the people in Sweden, the people 
in London and the people all over the world will run into Muslims. And then they will judge Islam by how the Muslims are. Not the Quran, not the Sunnah, but the Muslims. That's the question before us today in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and all the countries in Europe. One third of the Muslim Ummah live in non-Muslim countries. Where do you find them? You find them in Europe. You find them all over. Right now in Moscow, they're, they're building a masjid that would accommodate 60,000 worshipers. Everywhere you go on the earth, there are Muslims in the West and all over the world. Let me leave you with this. I got a couple of minutes. I have, I want to ask you permission to be honest tonight. To be honest and forthright? Yes? Or would you rather me give you a soothing sermonette on how to make wudu? I can be honest. I can give you facts. Some of you are hesitant. You don't want me to do this? You don't want Uncle Siraj? For the first time in the history of Norway, there are more atheists than Christians. In Sweden, 4,515,000 atheists, 46% of the population. In Netherlands, 6,769,000 atheists, 40% of the population. In United Kingdom, 25,920,000 atheists, 40% of the population. In France, 27,505,000 atheists, 41% of the population. In Germany, 30,855,000 atheists, 38% of the population. In Japan, 58,342,000 atheists, 46% of the population. In China, 1 million, 1 billion, 29 million atheists, 75% of the population atheists. What's going on? What's happening? We have a lot of work to do as Muslims. You who sit here have to make a decision. Like Sheikh Allah mentioned, are you going to be the same as you came into this conference? Now, I come from America. You know what's going on in America right now? I found out every country I go, I just mentioned Donald Trump and the people start laughing. I went to London and I was going through immigration and immigration looked at my passport. He said, oh, you from America? He says, uh, when is Donald Trump going to build that wall? And he started laughing everywhere I go. Let me give you some facts. Washington Times, a very respectable newspaper, said that since Donald Trump has been president, he's told more than 5,000 lies, 6.5 lies, lies a day. You're not supposed to laugh at that. Consider what the Prophet said, peace and blessing, blessing be upon him. Ayatu manafik falatha, idha haddha kathaba. The sign of a hypocrite is three. When they speak, they lie. Wa'idha wa'adha akhlafa. And when they make a promise, they break their promise. Wa'idha tumana khana. And when they are entrusted with something, they break their trust. The Muslims in the West have a terrific job to do. You in Norway must love your country. This is your country. Love it. Embrace it. 
and correct those things that need to be corrected. People are watching you. Our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, a great ambassador to Islam, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ أَلَّا قُولِ أَحْيَانِ And the messenger of Allah remembered Allah in every circumstance. Consider that. Always remembering Allah. I'm going to quote a part of the ayat, you finish it. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, Allah say, and I will remember you. Is it possible for us to outdo Allah in anything? If the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, always remember Allah, that has to mean that Allah is always remembering the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Good ambassador or bad? Where are you the ambassador? How many of you in college, raise your hand? High school. If you are a student, those students around you, they're looking at you and they will judge Islam by what they see from you. If you're a teacher, your students, if you're a professional, if you work in a business, uh, there is a store around my house, a Muslim store, and I go get newspapers every day. And one day I noticed something that I hadn't noticed before. There was a sign that said, in this Muslim store, owned by Muslims, there was a sign that said, no alcohol sold here. I said, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, no alcohol sold here until I took a closer look. It said, no alcohol sold here on Sundays before 2 p.m. No, man, you're the ambassador. And you know what non-Muslims say often? Really, it's a good thing. And when a Muslim does something that they're not supposed to do, you know what they say? You're supposed to be a Muslim. Why are you doing that? You're supposed to be a Muslim. So brothers and sisters, this is our challenge here in Norway, that we have to be ambassadors of Islam. You can't fake it. It don't mean you're not going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. But in the end, you don't want to be a hypocrite. You want to be an ambassador for Allah. A few things, and I, I close. Um, I was in Calgary, Canada, a couple of weeks ago, and the brother took me to the airport. He was telling me about a story that one day during Ramadan, a, a, it was coming out the masjid, and a white man, non-Muslim, came to him and said, you know, sir, you know, I need your help. You know, I, I lost my wallet, and I'm trying to get back home. I got a truck, and I need $300. And I said to myself, listen, I'm from New York. That's game. I mean, really, come, in, come on, $300? So the brother said he went back to the masjid. He said, you know, I don't have it on me, but let me go into the masjid. He asked the people, and they collected $300 for the brother. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Then the brother told me, two years later, he's in the masjid. And that same man that he gave $300 was in the masjid making salat. And when he finished, he looked at the brother and said, you remember me? He said, yes, you the man who wanted $300. He said, I'm a Muslim now. Sometimes you never know. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. You ever hear Walmart? Do you have Walmart here? Okay, but you've heard about it. I'm in Walmart and a Chinese man comes to me and say, Assalamu alaikum. And there was nothing about him, nor his wife and his daughter, would make you think they're Muslims. He didn't have a beard. He didn't wear a kufi. He didn't have, you know, a kameez. And she wasn't, didn't wear a khimar or nothing like that. 
But he said to me, Assalamu alaikum. Do you think I gave him the salams? Hmm? Of course. Why? Haqqu muslimi al muslim comes. Raddu salam. The right of a Muslim over another Muslim is five. And the first thing he said to return the salams. Someone asked the Prophet what Islam is best. He said to feed the people and to give salams to those whom you know and those whom you don't know. So I said to him, wa alaykum salam. You know what he said to me? He said, I'm a Muslim from China and I'm over here. I'll be here for a few weeks. Can you tell me where I can get halal food? So you want to make a judgment over a person. He's asking for halal food. I said to him, give me your phone number. I'll find out and I'll, and I'll give you a call. So I took out my pen and I said, what's your name? Where's he from? China. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jonathan. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> what's your real name? Now, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it went something like this. I ain't John. I said, oh, Jonathan. <laughs> that I get it. I still have his number to this day, and every once in a while we communicate. Because he asked. You see, brothers and sisters, we are ambassadors to Allah. I was in the Orlando, Florida during Ramadan, and had dinner with a brother named Arthur Richards, African-American, been a Muslim for six years. He said, Imam, I went to the country called Guinea-Bissau. You ever have Guinea-Bissau? Guinea-Bissau is different from Guinea. How do you know it? The official language of Guinea is French. The official language of Guinea-Bissau, Portuguese. One colonized by the French, other colonized by the Portuguese. He said, I went, it's a small country uh, northwest of Guinea. About 1.8 million people. Guinea, maybe about 12 million people. He said he went there with his teacher. And listen to this. They gave shahada at one time in Guinea-Bissau, 7,000 people. 7,000 people took shahada at one time? Why? Because their chief of that tribe took shahada. And once he took shahada, the entire tribe did. Brothers and sisters, um, we are the slaves of Allah. And the world is waiting for us. In my conclusion, every once in a while you read a book, and maybe there's one sentence, one phrase in that book that sticks out. I was reading a book called The Clash of Civilizations. How many read that book? The Clash? How many heard about it? Sammy P. Huntington. Check it out, page 51. And when I read that, it opened up my eyes. You know, every once in a while you read something and you say, did you hear what they just said? Class of Civilizations, page, page 51. Sammy P. Huntington said, the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or its values or its religion, but rather by its superiority in applying organized violence. Westerners often forget this fact. Non-Westerners seldom do or never do. We're here in Norway, in America, in France, in Germany, to service that community, to care. Yes, there's a lot of Islamophobia. I know that. We have to get beyond that, and we have to share what we have. I'm on the plane one day, 
and the plane just landed and the people getting off the plane. And I noticed there was an old white woman who was standing in the middle of the aisle. I sensed that she needed help. So I went to her and said, Madam, uh, can I help you? She said, yes, my, my luggage. I said, I'll get it for you. So I got the luggage and I said, would you want me to help you take it out? She said, no. She said, thank you, Sonny. So as I walked off the plane, a young white woman said to me, she said, sir, I saw what you did, and I want to thank you. I didn't do it because, you know, here I am. See my kufi? I'm helping this woman. And I did it for Allah. She's not Muslim, but I'm a Muslim. That's how we are. A lot of my dawah is on planes, honestly. Don't sit next to me on the plane because I'm going to talk to you. One day, I'm telling you, i never forget this. I'm on the plane, right, and I'm reading. I'm the kind of guy, I don't like people reading my, behind, behind me. You know, when somebody's looking, reading what I'm reading, like, honestly, that's the way I am, right? Well, one day I'm on the plane, I'm reading something about Islam, and the guy next to me was, so what I did, he was on my right, I did like this. And he read something. He said, are you Muslim? I said, yes. And we started talking. I was on a plane in the uh, British Airways. It was month, during the month of Ramadan. And the flight attendant said, sir, sir, she said, sir, would you like something to eat? I said, I would love something to eat, but I'm fasting. This is the month of Ramadan. So the guy next to me, from London started talking to me. So we spoke about half an hour about Islam. Every day you get opportunities to talk about Islam in a very natural way. On the job, you know, in school, it comes up. And so you have to be prepared, we have to be prepared to accommodate the people. I love Islam. I love Allah. I love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I love Muslims everywhere, you know, and um, let us be the examples, let us follow the example of the greatest ambassador, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah bless you, bless this conference, bless all the speakers. Assalamu alaikum.